Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Nation Building. On our program, we examine the political, social, and moral issues in the leadership of our country. On our program today, we're doing something different. We're in beautiful Jamaica, and we have one who some in his organization say is a potential future leader of this country, and we'll introduce him right after this break. What is a promise? A promise fulfilled can mean so much. A bond, a commitment, a yes in the world of maybes. We made a promise to you, and we delivered. Our super fast LTE network is now on every island, and every day we invest in local communities and technology because our promise is our guarantee. And now we promise our best is yet to come. Alive, believe, and best. Hello and welcome back to Nation Building. I'm your host, Winston Pinnock. On our program today, we have the privilege of having the former Minister of National Security under the PNP administration, Mr. Bunting. Welcome to our program, Nation Building, Mr. Bunting. How Thank are you, you, sir? I'm fine. Thank you. Wonderful. It is a pleasure having you here. And um, before we get on into the meat of our discussion today, I want to talk a little about your 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 background. I know before you were uh, entered politics, you had a I'm told a successful life. You know, so many of our politicians these days, uh, politics was their first um, first success, and so certainly in your case, that that is not the case. Um, our program, of course, as you know, is aired in the Bahamas. Uh, we are talking to Caribbean leaders uh, during this segment, this season of our program. Uh, talking about issues that affect our region. Um, so often we are segmented, uh, especially us in the Bahamas who have had the privilege of enjoying a very uh, successful, many, many decades of financial success. Um, but uh, as the world is changing, we're seeing the need in our region to come together more and to share ideas. And so this is what we are seeking to do as we move around the Caribbean islands to talk to leaders past and present and also future leaders um, about uh, things that's going on that affect us all in the region and uh, to look for answers. Uh, people are asking, um, frankly, I had a discussion before coming here to Jamaica with a group that said to me, look, enough of the politicians. We want to talk to people who can give us solutions. And, and, and so our, our program is heavily political because it's about building nation and politics does that at the core when it's being done right. So before we go any further, I just wanted to share that that is the thrust of uh, the next few months, which is to talk to leaders. So let's get right in then and um, talk to you. You served as a national security minister between January 2012 and uh, before your party lost power in 2016, so you served for four years as National mm -hmm. Security Minister, and I have a wealth of knowledge of um, the challenges of crime in our country, uh, in, in your country, and also we have similar problems in the Bahamas, and so I want to talk a little about that, but tell us a little about your professional life before coming to the political front in Jamaica. Well, I'm perhaps an unusual politician in Jamaica in that I've sort of gone back and forth between politics and banking, which is my uh, uh, professional career. I, I started off with Citibank in Jamaica, and after three years, started a merchant bank, a small merchant bank, along with some um, sort of angel investors. Uh, we, I sold my equity, my sweat equity in that, and started another company called Daring Bunting and Golding, which was a, a boutique investment bank. Uh, we grew that to a point where we were, we were able to sell it to Bank of Nova Scotia um, in 2006. And that sort of gave me an a independent financial base to come back into politics uh, full time. I became uh, an MP and general secretary of the party. 
and even today I still uh, maintain an interest in another uh, financial co um, company proven investments which today uh, has a wealth management subsidiary in Jamaica a pension fund management subsidiary we have an international bank in the Bahamas in sorry not in the Bahamas in St. Lucia but it's called Banca St. Lucia International we're doing or maybe you should bring one to the Bahamas branch of it I actually hope that you know maybe in the next couple of years when you inter interview me again if I have that privilege we can talk about an investment um, by then that we'll have made in the Bahamas we've actually um, had one eye on the Bahamas as a potential uh, for potential expansion we're, we're now seeking regulatory approval to go into Cayman and Bermuda we're acquiring a financial advisory firm there and we also um, have a small footprint in Panama so I, I'm, I managed to straddle um, both the financial sector and politics which is unusual to, to do them simultaneously of course in opposition I tend to do a little more of the because you have more time. business side because I have more time and and of course you that is what subsidizes my participation in, in 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 the public sector interesting that you pointed out and I want to be very specific today especially in our country um, we have a lot of young people interested and in participating in the political life of our country which is good and healthy um, but quite often you find that um, most of them don't understand the demands financial demands that is necessary to survive in in politics and so I found it interesting and so I want you to just add a little more meat on the bone for me okay. when you talk about three years in banking and then into an investment if you can help for the sake of those watching who are thinking about having a passion for serving their country but also need to understand the importance of finding their way financially so that they can have a foundation how did you move so quickly three years in banking to well three years in banking three years at Citibank and then I moved from Citibank to start an investment bank um, again I was still full-time in, in in banking but now in a more entrepreneurial role rather than being employed as a manager I was um, the managing director of this small boutique startup. So, so how many years did you work as before an employee going, before? Okay. Right. Well that's in interesting I probably worked uh, six years uh, well three years as an employee and then three years as an employee but small partner because I was earning a sweat equity in, in the new venture which was called Manufacturers Merchant Bank and after about six years um, in total since, since it's returning home from university I went into the public sector first to run the National Investment Bank of Jamaica which was a public sector investment bank in charge of the privatization of government entities um, we were coming from a period in the 70s and 80s where the state controlled many of the commercial sectors of the economy so I was put in charge of, of divesting um, radio stations um, shares in financial institutions um, you know agricultural entities uh, 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 a steel mill was that a mandate of uh, international bodies or was that something that internally the country I, I think we to had come to that position internally the PNP had moved from uh, a party a democratic socialist party that um, believed more in a mixed economy and, and that the state should control the commanding heights it was referred to as the time the commanding heights of the economy that was in the 70s but when we were returned to power in 89 um, under interestingly the same leader but who had evolved Michael, Manley, his, Michael Manley who had evolved in his own thinking and recognized that we needed to move to a market economy and so we moved from in a sense being democratic socialist to market socialist we still maintained um, that we were from a, a social democratic point of view you know um, more into providing equality of opportunity through the state but not for the state to be involved in the commercial machinery and so part of my role was to 
supervise the divestment of exactly. a lot of, of the um, government involvement in these various industries and sectors. Absolutely. While we won't um, spend much time talking about the past this evening, but y you pr you provoked me to ask. You, you were you still look like a very young man, but you were much <laughs> younger then. Um, your generation, how much re how far removed were you from Manley's democratic socialism philosophy? Because many argue that that really took the Jamaican economy to the pits in terms of not not the. It, not, not that he didn't have good intentions, but the, mm -hmm. the, the reaction from the U.S., the, the, the flight of investors who left the country. Were you troubled in that period? I was a teenager at the time, and I would say that, you know, I probably didn't grasp all the complexities of, of what Manly was trying to do within a very short period of time um, to, to fundamentally change the the socio-economic makeup of the society and perhaps he went too aggressively um, perhaps more quickly than the uh, finances could afford you know announcing free education for example at all levels um, was was something that we struggled during a time when you, you remember there was the the oil crisis of, of the, the 1970s, of the late 70s, 70s and Jamaica was was you know literally pilloried by that and we had to we were in a cold war kind of environment where uh, Michael was trying to you know develop a new sort of paradigm of South South cooperation and um, very friendly relations with Cuba which you know upset the United, the States. United States and we were one of the first countries for example to have established diplomatic relations with communist China at the time so we were in a sense caught up in a, in a whole set of forces that we could not um, or we did not anticipate how that would uh, impact and I think although from a social legislation point of view um, and the whole sense of giving Jamaicans, black Jamaicans in particular a sense of identity and a sense of ownership in the society I think that was successful obviously on the economic side it was much less successful and some would say a disaster well, <laughs> I mean so that's you know, some, some argue opposing views but the point point is made what led you as a young university graduate to the People's National Party in Jamaica why not the uh, the JLP well precisely because of the um, what I thought Michael Manley represented um, it was really about an empowerment of the average person. Michael was a came from that small fraction of the elite who were conscious enough to want to use their privilege to serve the average Jamaica. And I saw that as contrasted with the other party who were more interested in serving the privileged classes. And that had been the you know the traditional difference. So I I was you know very much um, well I want to say radical, but you know as if if you're a young person and you're you know you're not a, a socialist at heart, then something is wrong with you. <laughs> um, so I, I sort of followed that. I mean there was a lot of other things going on. There was a Black Power movement in the United States. You know you will recall in the late '60s and early '70s. You know starting with. Um, you know all the civil rights movements and the you know and the, the Tommy Smith raising the fist at the 68 Olympics and coming right up and I was you know a child in in, in you know eight ten twelve but being up impacted that, by that whole being era. impacted by that whole in era. interesting that four decades later we still have uh, Bernie Sanders in the U.S. elections just over a year ago a year and a half almost two years ago would have represented somewhat a similar movement very similar actually to very to, similar. to to what and some say the democratic party in america fell um because of the fact that sanders was not successful in defeating clinton so the point i'm making is that it seems as if every generation faced the same crisis exactly. in, in some regards and, and have what, we learned and, but what i think is that you you it, it's sort of a, like a pendulum and it swings back and forth um if you if you spend um, 
too much on, on trying to do a lot in terms of social re-engineering or social engineering, um, you tend to, to have the pendulum swing back the other way. It has to, to balance. People feel overtaxed. They feel um, that businesses are not getting sufficient attention and this is what will eventually generate the, the, the revenues to, to finance these things. So you, you tend to find that the pendulum goes back and forth, not just in the Caribbean, but internationally. You know? So, and, and my point was, before we close the segment, do you think your generation, who is now, uh, many of you in the, in the upper echelon of the political leadership in the country, in your country, have you learned the lessons of the set? I think so. I think so. And if you look at the, our last administration, um, which, although it was led by Portia Simpson Miller, who was seen as perhaps one of the last of the populist leaders um, in the Caribbean, she was very fiscally conservative in that period, 2012 to 2016, and it actually um, gave us the base for a turnaround in our economic fortunes. So you see, our, the, our debt trajectory has been our debt has been trajectory. on a downward trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, our um, unemployment rate is falling. Our poverty rate is falling. Um, our growth still anemic, but at least positive. And you know, people generally have a much stronger outlook from that foundation. And this, as I said, came from one of traditionally someone who would be got, have been regarded as one of the most populist leaders. Wonderful. You're watching Nation Building. I'm your host, Winston Pinnock. Uh, we'll be right back after these messages. What is a promise? A promise fulfilled can mean so much. A bond, a commitment, a yes in the world of maybes. We made a promise to you, and we delivered. Our super fast LTE network is now on every island. And every day we invest in local communities and technology. Because our promise is our guarantee. And now we promise our best is yet to come. Alive. Believe in best. Hello, I'm Wendell Jones, and every time I sit down and I watch JCN television, I drink the Jamaica Bahama food juice. It's so pleasing to the palate. I've been cooking Bahamian dishes for generations. I now use Jamaica Bahama product. The rice is very fluffy, very tasty, and good eating. Jamaica Bahama product is simply the best. As an insurance agent, my life is go, go, go. But whenever I need a refreshing break, it's Jamaica Bahamas Island Mixed Fruit Drink. Mmm, good. Hi, I'm Debbie Bartlett from GEMS 105.9 FM. The effect that Island Junkanoo Juice Medley has on me is <laughs> exhilarating. It's the market for the entire family. Soya's Fresh Market. Bahamian owned and operated, Soya's is known for the lowest prices on meats, produce, fresh fruits, and vegetables. Check them out on Facebook and the Freeport News to find out all their weekly specials and their monthly blowout sales. Soya's Fresh Market. Your grocery bill just got lower. said you can't get great quality products at an affordable price. If you want the best quality food products at the most affordable prices, you must pick up the Jamaica Bahama brand of fine quality products at your favorite food store. Products like Jamaica Bahama Coconut Water, the most healthy and refreshing drink on the market. Jamaica Bahama Fruit Punch, the only fruit punch in the Bahamas made from real fruit. Jamaica Bahama Coconut Milk, Green Pigeon Peas with Coconut Milk, Condensed Milk, Kidney Beans with Coconut Milk, Corn Beef, Green Pigeon Peas, Mackerel, and Corn. Jamaica Bahama's fine line of products is available at all your favorite food stores and convenience stores nationwide. Telephone 351-8282 in Freeport and 341-4091 in Nassau. I don't want to win. Hello and 
welcome back to Nation Building. I'm your host, Winston Pinnock. And today we are doing something very exciting and different. We're in Jamaica and we are talking to the former Minister of National Security in Jamaica, Mr. Peter Bunting. Uh, Mr. Bunting, you have a very distinguished career, career in banking and you, you obviously uh, made a name for yourself before entering politics. I'm not sure if for the sake of viewers um, look, tracing your history, if we answered the question of the transition uh, from your banking career to politics in terms of what happened specifically? Well, the truth of the matter is I think I probably transitioned into representational politics too early. I became a, a candidate for the party when I was 29 and I actually was elected as an MP when I was 32. I was the, the youngest in that batch and interestingly... What year was that? This was 1993. And interestingly, my opponent was a former Prime Minister of Jamaica, Hugh Shearer, who was the oldest in that batch. Oh, gee. That's <laughs> so it was quite a contrast. And um, So you beat the former Prime Minister? I beat the former Prime Minister in a constituency he had represented for 27 years at the time. And so halfway into this um, term, my first term as an MP, as a young man with a young family, it hit me that I didn't have a strong enough financial foundation to be able to be an honest politician and also give my family, my kids in particular, the opportunities that I wanted to be able to give them. So after my first term, I actually withdrew. I didn't run again. I didn't offer myself for re-election and I withdrew for 10 years, went back into banking full-time and developed that, that new company that I had started before, but which I'd left to um, a partner to run. So I went back, took, it, took over as CEO, and, and really put all my energies there so that by the time the 2007 election came around, I now had that independent financial foundation and I could throw myself you know, headlong into politics, not, as I said, not just to become an MP, but to be the general secretary of the party to be the shadow spokesman on, on, on security, eventually winning the election as, as the campaign manager and becoming Minister of National that, Security. That, I don't want to lose that point. I think it's a powerful point that's relevant here in Jamaica as well as in the Bahamas. And that is, you pointed to the fact that in order to become an honest <laughs> politician, you made that move. Are you suggesting then that not being financially independent is what drives corruption in politics? I think that can be one of the the the, um, the incentives or the or the drivers. I mean, obviously, I think if you have a sufficiently strong character, you know, regardless of of the pressure you're under, you're not going to succumb to it. But uh, it it do, I have seen, and I, and this is you know my own observation and my own conclusions that I think a lot of young people who have got, got gone into politics um, have been pressured into into cutting corners. Let me say at a minimum to be to be kind to to be you know speaking euphemistically, you know you know getting you know friends contracts or doing things like that so that unethical you know, things they can they can get support from them. And, and often gets them into trouble. And so if young people today ask my advice, having been someone, as I said, who had been very young as a, as a constituency caretaker and, and candidate, I discourage them from offering themselves for representation too early. I said, you can be involved in politics, you can support your party, you can support candidates, you can do stuff um, behind the scenes or you know, even on, on the road or on a political platform. But when you go offer yourself full time into representational politics, it should not be as a business. You don't do politics as your business or as your profession. You 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 come from a base of already having been successful in business or in a profession, and then having established yourself you independently there, you can now give something back. Quite interesting. You talked about being a family man. Uh, you have a wife and how many children? Well, I've, I've been married a, a few times. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm the most successful example. But um, I have 
I'm, I'm married now and I have four children. Okay, you have four children. And yeah. so I, did, I, I wanted to just get the point of the family, yes. whole family involvement and the demands on you. Uh, talking about family life, what, in your opinion, what role and what impact and what significance do you see the church in Jamaica having in dealing with the issue as we dive into the crime issue, in, in dealing with the social ills of your country? Well, the church is, is a powerful um, is a powerful social organization, the most powerful um, organization, social organization in Jamaica. It, it, you know, the membership of the church outstrips that of political parties, outstrips that of basically any other um, organization. And many churches, I think, have played uh, an important role, a critical role in um, social interventions generally and some more directly in terms of violence prevention initiatives and violence interruption initiatives. One of my uh, programs as, as minister was called Unite for Change and it was really about building a coalition between public sector um, bodies, you know, the Ministry of National Security, the police, the secur the other security forces, the, the army, and uh, private sector civil society organizations, of which the church was a key element of that. And and we had, I think, some considerable success. In fact, the, um, the year after we launched it and, and really got it going was perhaps the year that we've had the lowest um, rate of violent crime in about the last two decades. So I think, I believe that that sort of broad partnership is really what is necessary to successfully combat violent crime. It's not just a uh, security forces sort of um, responsibility. And I think if we, if we do that, if we say, look, it's just the police or the police with the support of the army, the Coast Guard, whatever, then I think we let all the other actors off the hook because we, we didn't get where we are um, just because of the gangs and the um, narcotics trafficking and stuff, which is important, but it's because there was uh, a fertile audience for them um, or a fertile ground, uh, ground for them to, to, to take root in. And that came from failures or weaknesses at the level of family, at the level of school, at the level of community, at the level perhaps even of church and other civil society but, organizations. But, but, but Minister, you, looking back, you had four years and you implemented programs such as that, that you pointed to, to work with the church. Why was that not continued to, to continue to, to, to reap the benefits, seeing that you said it was, after all, an impactful program? that reduced crime to one of the lowest levels in decades. Why not continue? Um, I think it, it was a casualty of, of the change of administration. And, you know, the one thing I appealed to my successor because in, you know, in, in the transition, I, I sat with him just like we're sitting down, no one spent a, an evening. And I, one thing I tried to impress on him, um, you know, just, you know, you want to do your own thing and you want it, but there's just carry this forward, carry this initiative forward and I will support you a hundred percent. And he didn't listen. And he didn't listen. And um, and violent crime increased by about 35% in the couple of years after the transition. So, uh, you know, it's one of these, I think the stops and starts of many, um, of many policy initiatives not just in crime, so but it's in a, it's a lack of continuity, in finance, etc. I think, has and, and many people in our region, and certainly in our country, in the Bahamas, say that uh, people like yourselves in leadership in politics really is the problem in that you fail to, you 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 fail to to have continuity with things that work, and you pay more attention to political expedience as opposed to not being nationalist at heart in doing what is best. Do you think party politics and the culture of party politics is a major destructive force in our region? You know, I think that can be argued. Um, I think there, the points you've made um, that the, the, the competition has tended to be more about 
um, gaining power and then secondarily about moving the country forward. And, you know, I think there have been exceptions um, over time. I think we've seen um, some politicians, I like to, to use the, the example in Barbados of Erskine Sandefur, mm -hmm. who back in the 90s, uh, you know, did some very hard fiscal adjustments facing almost certain loss as a consequence, um, you know, electorally, but put Barbados on a good trajectory for the next tw 20 years. Um, uh, he, he may have been turning in his grave in the last few I years. was going to point out that Mia Motley has now inherited a, uh -huh. a mess, it seems. But um, because that was not followed in the last few so years. So again, there's another example but, of lack of continuity. Right, but... Um, it did last for, for, it had a good run in, in Barbados. But what it shows is that even in a highly educated population like Barbados, we're still vulnerable. And, you know, people don't always translate that sort of formal education into a, a capacity for critical thinking, you know. And, and it also says a lot about our education system. I think we've been very much... Um, driven by the old curriculum based education system and, and you know we carry people to do their um, CXCs, we prepare them for that but we're not really pre teaching them how to learn and preparing them to be good citizens and, and, and developing their critical thinking skills so that you know they're able to separate you know the sort of tribal approach of, of, many, of politics in many of our um, countries, countries. Um, from what is really good for the country. And so at the end of the day, it is a lack of national identity, a lack of nationalism, a lack of, again, I point to you, not personally, but you people in leadership, of not engendering the kind of culture, developing the kind of culture with the native, with the citizens of your country to cause them to put, as some of us in the Bahamas like to say, a country first uh, over the political establishment and so your point is well taken uh, before we go to another break I, I, I must ask you what is your take on the impact of the significant Chinese investment in Jamaica and um, I've seen significant road and infrastructure work being done by the Chinese uh, it, and there are many sentiments about the impact of that what is your take on that well we really saw the Chinese come into Jamaica investing in a big way post um, the world crisis, the financial crisis in 2008, 2009 coming forward, when essentially the capital markets, the commercial capital markets were, were closed to Jamaica. And, you know, we largely because we have not managed our affairs responsibly. Well. And I think that is not, again, unique to Jamaica. I think a number of, of our Caribbean partners have been like that. And so the Chinese were the only game in town, so to speak, because the construction firms came twinned with the capital from the Chinese development banks. And just to be clear by that for our listeners, by that you mean the Chinese as a practice will not uh, lend or or donate or contribute their monies without having Chinese labor, am I right? That's correct. And well, first of all, the Chinese state-owned enterprises are the construction firms. And and they they come, they partner with the Chinese uh, Chinese development bank. So they come and say, look, not only will we build this road for you, but we'll finance it and we'll give you, you know, twenty years to repay it. And at a time when you're struggling with, you know, um, accessing capital markets, sometimes you have IMF programs, etc. There, there are not many options. So a number of countries have gone for that. Isn't the, that short-sighted, though, Minister? Well, um, some would say selling out the future. Well, the 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 challenge is not so much that we access that at a time when we had no choice, but what. I am disappointed in is that as we have improved is that we're still going down that that path almost from habit and and oftentimes because our negotiating 
um, position was weak relative to the, the Chinese firms. We gave all sorts of concessions. Unnecessarily? You know? Well, maybe necessary initially. Five years later, unnecessarily to my mind. So I think the, we have to know, and, and you know, speaking not just for Jamaica, but I think um, for, for many of the Caribbean islands, as we do better at managing our own um, economic affairs, that we have to be more discriminating in the deals that we go into with whether Chinese or any um, foreign or local entity in terms of really negotiating hard. Um, I think it's better to borrow the money separately and, and tender for the construction contracts and have them as two separate things so that you can always be assured that in a competitive tender environment, you'll get a better price than in a sole sourcing type of environment. You're watching Nation Building. I'm your host, Winston Pinnock, and we'll be right back after these messages. What is a promise? A promise fulfilled can mean so much. A bond, a commitment, a yes in the world of maybes. We made a promise to you, and we delivered. Our super fast LTE network is now on every island, and every day we invest in local communities and technology because our promise is our guarantee. And now we promise our best is yet to come. Alive, believe, and best. It's the market for the entire family. Sawyer's Fresh Market. Bahamian owned and operated, Sawyer's is known for the lowest prices on meats produce, fresh fruits, and vegetables. Check them out on Facebook and the Freeport News to find out all their weekly specials and their monthly blowout sales. Sawyer's Fresh Market. Your grocery bill just got lower. said you can't get great quality products at an affordable price. If you want the best quality food products at the most affordable prices, you must pick up the Jamaica Bahama brand of fine quality products at your favorite food store. Products like Jamaica Bahama Coconut Water, the most healthy and refreshing drink on the market. Jamaica Bahama Fruit Punch, the only fruit punch in the Bahamas made from real fruit. Jamaica Bahama Coconut Milk, Green Pigeon Peas with Coconut Milk, Condensed Milk, Kidney Beans with Coconut Milk, Corned Beef, Green Pigeon Peas, Mackerel, and Corn. Jamaica Bahama's fine line of products is available at all your favorite food stores and convenience stores nationwide. Telephone 351-8282 in Freeport and 341-4091 in Nassau. I don't wanna win. Welcome back to Nation Building. I'm your host, Winston Pinnock. And as mentioned earlier, we are in beautiful Jamaica, um, meeting and interviewing some of the those in leadership in this country and seeking to find uh, solutions to issues that are challenging them that also challenge us in the Bahamas. And so today we're talking to a former Minister of National Security who's still in Parliament and uh, talking about crime issues and other issues uh, relevant. Um, I must um, say, um, Mr. Bunting, uh, I'll provoke you with this thought. Um, I spoke to some in your organization who have said, don't know if they go on record to say this publicly, but they have said to me, uh, those I've spoken to, that you um, represent that under 60 generation that wants reform and change to the status quo and some so many of the practices, some say undemocratic practices in party politics in our region. And so if that is true, I it begs the question, why would you have given up the opportunity to uh, 
vie for leadership in your organization at such a critical time when there's such a loud cry from that generation or grouping of, of people to who want to see a departure, as you said earlier, from the Portia Simpson generation, charismatic leadership and all that represents to a, and that, that age grouping as well, to a younger generation with a different mindset, if you will, and it is noted that on the, resig the resignation of Miss Simpson Miller, Jamaica's former and first female prime minister, that you were in the runnings and highlighted as very likely to uh, to take over the party, and you simply, uh, in my words, disappeared, surrendered that leadership challenge to Dr. Peter Phillips, who is now the leader of your party. I explained that to uh, people. Well. Um, two things. First of all, your um, your contest within the party is not determined by the general population. So, regardless of whether you think you might be um, popular you know, popular in the majority of the population, it's really a delegate body, a very small, relatively small delegate body that chooses the party leader. And <clears throat> I think the the Dr. Phillips better represented. The, what the delegate body was looking for at the, that time. And I, I recognize that. And I, having been general secretary, when we had a very um, divisive sort of uh, toxic environment contest for the last leadership campaign, and, and so having seen what that can do, um, I decided that, you know, I thought it didn't make sense. I will allow Dr. Phillips to, to go forward. The, gen, the consensus was that it was his time. Uh, the second thing, though, is that people go into politics, or, there are, let me put it another way, there are two types of politicians. Um, one set who want to be something. So they want to be an MP, or they want to be a minister, or they want to be a prime minister. And another set who want to do something. And I come from really that latter um, school, so to speak. I am in politics because I want to make changes. I want to improve people's lives. I want to, um, you know, craft new policies, new program initiatives. And so it matters less to me what the position that I hold, because I think you can lead from almost any position that you're, you're, you're given. And so, for example, I'm very passionate about crime and corruption, and, and I continue to provide leadership both in Parliament and, and um, outside Parliament on those issues, um, whether I am nominally the, the, the spokesman on those issues or not, because it's something that I feel very passionate about. I feel very, very passionate about education and the type of education that, that we should be offering and, and combating the what I call the apartheid system in education that we have where we have really two different um, standard, two different tiers of quality um, in our high schools and, and which get very different results. You know, the, the top third, the traditional high schools, 80% um, of the graduates, you know, meet a, a minimum threshold of five CXEs, math, English are prepared to go forward to for tertiary education or training. While from the bottom two thirds, the non traditional high schools, only twenty percent meet that standard. Now these are things that are totally unacceptable for to me and, and these are the things that motivate me to continue in politics. Whether you know I have a particular um, title or not, I was general secretary of the party, which was one of the most senior officer positions, did that for eight years. And I voluntarily chose to give it up and not run for another position because I then wanted to focus on national security, which I thought was so critical to our developmental prospects. And, and so, you know, I, I don't um, get too concerned about, you know, a particular leadership post, a particular leadership post. Um, they say when the pupil is ready, the teacher will appear. <laughs> And so I, I, let, I let, let, let's in the short time that we have see if we can get through. But I would do a disservice to those watching if I didn't follow that uh, quest, follow that answer up with a quick question, which is, how do you, with a straight face, say to that generation and grouping of people 
who have heard this cry, it's this one time and it's the next one time. How do you say to them as a representative of that generation, a uh, grouping, uh, let's delay this process when technically, if, if the, the party delegates are wrong, I'm not saying they are, but if they're wrong, you're going to sit out another five years out of, out of government and you're, the people that you represent in your organization and in the country will have to sit back and wait for a, a longer time to, to, to well, have someone who represent their issues come forward. Well, what, I, what I would say to them is get involved. Get involved so that you can have a say in, in choosing who you want to lead, whether at the local government level, at the constituency level, at the national level. And I, I try not to make it about me, um, but really what is, is a movement that you want to see that's going to be um, transformational for the country, that will get people excited, particularly young people who, you know, tend not to be too interested or involved. We have um, relatively low voter participation right across the age cohorts in Jamaica. This has been falling steadily over the last 30, four or five years. elections. So, you know, we've seen, you know, from, I think the, the peak was in the late 80s, early 90s, and it has been sort of tailing off steadily. Even though our population is growing, or the numbers that participate in elections are pretty constant. Standard, right. So, um, th these, are, these are some of the challenges. Are, are you quickly, are you suggesting then that uh, for those younger people and others who want to see transformation to our system, that the change will begin from the bottom up. Absolutely. I, I believe that um, a, a, a movement, a party, a country will select leaders that best reflect their level of aspiration and, and political do, consciousness. Do you then agree that the current system that we all practice in the Caribbean, where the, the party leaders simply need to position themselves right among delegates as opposed to what the population think. Do you think that we need to move, generally speaking, away from that and seek to find something more uh, more like what the Americans do where participation primaries, is primaries? Yes. And is that something I, that you favor? Absolutely. I think the, the wider participation in, in selection, in a sense, you, the, the, the bigger your sample, the more likely it will be representative, be of, representative the of the population. Yeah. So let, 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 let's it. jump into some crime issue. You, you, first of all, have you, um, the issue of crime, has it had a significant negative impact on your tourism product in Jamaica while you serve um, as minister? You know, I think we have had, we've struggled with this issue for so long that the, the tourism industry has become quite adept at um, you know, marketing and growing, notwithstanding the fact that we've had a fairly high crime rate for decades. And our actual crime against tourists is quite low. Um, so they've managed to make that distinction. And, um, and so we've seen a steady increase in the numbers. Where I think we've paid a price is that we've probably had to discount our rates much lower than we otherwise would have had to um, if you look at in the order rates, to attract in order to, to keep attracting the numbers so you know if you look at a, a Barbados or even a Bahamas you've probably been able to successfully position your your industry yeah we're a, certainly one of the more expensive level. destinations and still our level. proximity helps us so that, that well. has been a benefit um, when you took office in 20 uh, 2012 I believe it is when you became minister what, generally speaking, was the state of crime in the country, and particular more serious crimes, murder and the likes? What the um, numbers were like, roughly? Huh. We were, interestingly, we, we had come through, we were um, on, a, on a slight downward trajectory. Um, we'd had this, this um, uh, sort of trauma of the extradition of Christopher Polk. I don't know if you, yes, you I'm very aware of that. Mm -hmm. And which which had played a, a that, significant that actually role some say played in, a big role in your becoming government exactly in and and, and I did I, I I mean I, I I do agree with that I I think it did play a significant role and um, so we had a, a slight downward trajectory which we were able to maintain that downward trajectory 
and um, but we not only not only in murder but in in all you know the categories of, of serious and violent crimes um, I think we also were able to fundamentally change the relationship between the police and the citizenry um, we for decades we our police had been um, fatally shooting three to four hundred young Jamaicans annually spa, annually wow. and we reduced that by 70 percent um, during my time in office we we used to arrest over a thousand young men per month for possession of small quantities of ganja we decriminalized that and and reduced those arrests by 14,000 per year and and part of that amendment to the dangerous drugs act also um, expunge their records um, for those who had been convicted historically. So we were able to bring you know tens of thousands of young Jamaicans back into the mainstream of society where they could apply for a visa, where they could get a job at you know at, at some places that required a clean police record, etc. So some in our country, uh, it's a big debate that has gone on over the last year about this whole marijuana issue. And so I'd like to quickly ask you, what has been the effect? Has it been more negative or positive about the decriminalization of, of marijuana? I think it has been tremendously positive How so? in, in Jamaica. As I said, because here we had a, we had created an underclass of perhaps if you take if you if you take the averages of fourteen thousand per year over a, a decade or two, you'd probably have had a couple of hundred thousand young men who are consigned to the margins of the economy by virtue of having a criminal record for really a non-violent offense, an offense that um, you know it would, is, is a misdemeanor in many countries. And we were giving them these criminal records. They couldn't apply for a visa. Um, they couldn't get on the farm or overseas work programs. They couldn't uh, get a job in a bank or, or many jobs in the, even in the public sector. Um, so, you know, they were really consigned to the backwater of the economy. And so we, we removed that and we brought them back into the mainstream and created new opportunities for them. We've cut down on the backlog in the courts. Just imagine 14,000 additional cases going through the, the parish courts every year. We've now taken that out so that um, the, the more meaningful cases can, can get attention. We've removed this as a source of friction between communities and the police. Because communities never saw this as a serious offense. And they thought that the police would use it in a sort of arbitrary fashion to, to, to target the youngsters. And um, they saw it as, as unjust. And so it created this friction between police and communities. So all of, all of that, I think, um, all of those sources of friction, all of those, the congestion in the courts, the, the overcrowding in our jails and our lockups um, that have come from, from decriminalizing this, I think are all positive. The, the, um, as we get ready to wrap up here, the current administration has had their hands full on the crime front. Uh, many that I speak to since I've been here says it is the one vexing issue that could topple the government and they, they, generally there's a sentiment that there are many things going right but that particular issue is one that is, is certainly not uh, going in the right direction. And they have come up with uh, what I've been told is a five-point crime plan uh, strategy to combat. Uh, one of the things that they have done uh, is have these special zones of operation. And I know it's sexy being in opposition to just oppose. And so you have an opportunity as a future leader of your country to say here, do you support the government on things that like these if it's as some have said it's yielding with success and do you disagree um, we so su we'll support the government on anything that makes sense the special zones of operation have been implemented in two tiny geographic areas which have have really had no impact on the overall crime uh, rate what the government has done is declared a, a limited state of emergency in, in St. James and in St. Catherine North. Hot crime hotspots. Which are traditional crime hotspots. And poured a lot of resources in terms of personnel, just um, saturation policing in those communities. And we've seen some reduction in those communities. It hasn't really influenced um, 
the overall crime rate as much as you would think because it, is, it has been so focused on those communities. The other concern is that it's not really sustainable um, because a tremendous amount of um, resources have been spent in those areas. Now, I'm not knocking the government that if things are running out of control, you need to do something just to, to stop it. And sometimes you need that short-term type of intervention, that saturation policing. But long-term, is really only addressing the root causes of crime that's going to give you sustainable success. We have to get into those communities, those informal communities where in Montego Bay, for example, Greater Montego Bay, 60 to 70 percent of the people live in communities that were started informally as squatter communities. We need to upgrade the roads, the water, the light, the the garbage collection, the social so, services so social that we provide, issues, the that, schools. Mm -hmm. Until we address these root causes, we'll always be outing the, 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 the flames um, and not cutting off the fuel. Before I let you go, I have to ask, um, the, the future of your country depends so much on your addressing the crime issue. But there's another issue, and that is the issue of international pressure. Uh, I noted quite well over the years that Jamaica has been very stubborn um, in some areas of international pressure. I noted the President of the United States, uh, former President Obama, when he visited here, started to apply some pressure uh, on the uh, your administration uh, about this whole, under the equality banner, about moving to, um, for lack of a better term, provide more freedom for, for gays and lesbians and so forth and, and LGBT community. Is that issue, which has traditionally been a very sore point in Jamaica, any future administration that you are leading or playing a significant role in, is that something that sits that you can see yourself supporting a gay marriage, for example, going to that extreme? <laughs> Uh, well, no, I don't think I would. I would venture into 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 that area. I don't. I just don't think that's a big issue in Jamaica. What what I am for though is standing up for um, against victimization of of anybody for who they are. I'm against um, violent uh, uh, crime. You know, we we've had a lot of uh, in the past a lot of discrimination which has manifested itself violently against. Uh, gay people, for right. example, and I think we must be absolutely intolerant of that. And once you established, once you remove that level of discrimination, I am not an expert into going into the, the other levels and what are the opportunities that, that you create. I, these are not really things that my constituents feel, you know, uh, pressure me about or, or it's, but, but it's minister not to them. interrupt but some say that with the joining of WTO and world organizations such it's only a matter of time before you have to bend to satisfy those world organizations by joint by providing these uh, um, um, as I said my my the, the the angle I take it from personally is a, is a human rights angle um, I, I am against discrimination I don't think people should have to fear violent victimization etc and and so that is is the, the track that I take um, now in terms of taking on the church about whether marriage is um, you know is, is for man and woman within the uh, the sacrament of marriage I'm certainly not going to take to, to take on that issue I don't I think that is you know um, but but as a leader not, would you agree and I will rest this here as a leader wherever you find yourself on the spectrum wouldn't you agree that this, this is an issue that even now Caribbean countries are grappling with because of whatever pressure? Well, we, we have seen, what should I say, I, I think there have been a number of rulings in different countries, I think Belize and in, in, in other countries, that seem to be bringing us more in line with um, the, the new the world European and, and the, um, the North American uh, sort of... Uh, norms um, but I think we're still a far away from you know things like sanctioning gay marriage and that sort of thing. Well said. Um, it's been a pleasure sitting with you today sir. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your thoughts on a plateau of issues 
um, that affect our country. And on behalf of all of us here at Nation Building, I want to thank you for watching this broadcast. Stay tuned, as always, and have a great week.